Today's story is a special story. Who here has ever heard of a cautionary tale? No one? Well, a cautionary tale is a story that doesn't end very well. That's right. But today, we have a hero. And that hero, he doesn't listen to the advice given to him. And that makes the story end very, very poorly. Now, who's ready for a story? Hi. All right! Welcome, everyone, as we continue along in a series we've been doing titled Cautionary Tales. For those of you joining us in the loft, part of our colonial family, a big shout out and welcome to you guys. And for others watching on the internet, we're glad that you're taking time to hang out with us today. Now, the whole goal of this entire series has been for us to really learn some of the most valuable life lessons we can learn by sparing ourselves the pain of having to actually learn them the hard way. We're going to learn good lessons from some of the bad examples that we find in the stories and the scriptures. And so today's lesson is titled, Don't Discount Yourself. Don't Discount Yourself. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to be in the New Testament today, Mark and chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. Everything will be on the screen so we can move through the message. I'm going to challenge you to take some notes so on the seat back in front of you. You'll find paper and pen. Feel free to use that. Or if you have a smartphone and maybe the YouVersion Bible app, you can look up the live event, Colonial Church, and our notes are in there. We can move through the message together. As we get started today, I am curious, how many of you, by show of hands, everybody help me out, have ever made a bad trade? Because your hands, bad trade, you had something good, you traded for something better, turned out wasn't better at all. One time I was in second grade, and it was lunchtime. This little girl sitting across from me wanted to trade her candy bar for my banana. She's like, hey, I'll trade you. You know, I'm like, really? Candy bar? I'm like, banana? Good. Candy bar? better. This is a no-brainer. So I trade the banana for the candy bar. I open the candy bar only to find it's not a candy bar at all. It's a health food candy bar. In other words, it was a sesame seed bar. And I'm like, what is this? Like, am I a parrot? Is this parrot food? Are you eating parrots? This is not a candy bar. Turns out it was a bad trade, and I later regretted it. Later on in my life, when I was a young adult, I made another bad trade. Not very proud of this one at all. One time, as an adult, young adult, I traded away our second car. We had a second car. I was kind of broken down a little bit. It's the second car. I traded away our second car for a pizza. Hey, I feel your judgment. It was Chicago pizza. What am I supposed to do? So I traded away this car for a pizza. And I'll admit, it was a bad trade, but it really became apparent how bad the trade was when just a little while after that trade, our primary car broke down, and I needed that car. Here's a question. What makes a trade a bad trade? Answer is called the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. Somebody be like, what's an opportunity cost? Well, economists refer to the opportunity cost. It's, it describes the value of what you give up in exchange for what you got, the opportunity cost. So let's say, for example, you have $3. That's all you got. You could either buy the, you know, $3 gallon of milk, right? You can do that. Or you could spend $3 on a gallon of gas and get yourself to work. But you can't do both, okay? So you take your $3 and you buy the gallon of milk. The opportunity cost for buying the gallon of milk would be not buying the gallon of gas, which means you wouldn't be able to drive to work and actually earn a day's pay. Well, look, it's the other way around. If you spent your $3 on the gallon of gas, your opportunity cost is you don't get milk today. You got to wait. You had to go to work and I had to wait for payday. Here's a question. By show of hands, how many of you think a, a one day's pay is more valuable than one day's milk? Can I see your hands? And you are correct. It's the opportunity cost. It's the value of what you give up versus the value of what you get. What's the lesson? Here's the lesson. Some choices in life cost you. 
painfully more than you ever bargained for. Seemed like a good trade, didn't think a whole lot about it, but in the end, you lost, and you lost big time. And that's where cautionary tales can be so helpful. Cautionary tales are designed to prevent the pain of learning everything the hard way. Here's the definition of cautionary tales we've been using all throughout this series. Here it is. We'll give it to you again. It's a story in which something bad happens to a person due to their choices that serves as a warning to others for the future. Cautionary tales come to us from the realm of folklore, and every cautionary tale has three elements. The first one is a warning. Some action is said to be dangerous. Second element is a disregard. A person disregards said warning and does the forbidden act. And the third element in a cautionary tale is the unpleasant fate. The offender experiences the horrible consequences of disregarding said warning and doing the dangerous act. Now, there's some good news today. Here's good news. Jesus Christ sees dangers where we often do not. So often we're blinded. We have blind spots, all of us, and we sometimes can't quite see dangers, but Jesus sees them. And in Mark chapter 10, he applies the concept of opportunity cost in a conversation with a guy who's called the rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus and asks him a question about eternal life. Good news that Jesus sees dangers that we often don't see. Here's the bad news. According to Jesus, there is a danger in money and possessions that we often don't see. There's a danger there. And that danger is that money and possessions often can block our way to God. So wait a minute, how does that even work? Well, I'm gonna share it with you this way. There's a 19th century Dutch theologian by the name of Abraham Kuyper. Abraham Kuyper asked a question, and I just want to put this question in front of you and turn on the movie screens in your mind and just think about this question. Here it is. We're going to put it up on the screen. Here it is. Would you rather be in a room with a rabid horse or a rabid mouse? Just think about it for a second. You're in a room. You get a choice. You're either in a room with a rabid horse or a rabid mouse. Think about it. For me, I'd rather be in the room with the rabid mouse. Why? Because I think it'd be kind of funny to watch a rabid mouse bounce around. I think it would be T not funny at all to have a rabid horse going crazy in the room that I'm in, kicking out the walls, tearing the place apart, threatening my very life. But Jim, what's the point? Here's the point. The greater the being, the worse the damage if it goes bad. The greater the force, the worse the damage if it goes bad. Money is one of those forces in human existence that under the influence of sin, can do so much damage through our own bad choices. The greater the force, the greater the damage if it goes bad. I mean, it's one thing. It's one thing to trade away you know, a, a car for a pizza. That's one thing. It's another thing altogether to trade yourself away for anything less than God's best for your life. And that's what we see in the story that we're going to look at today. So here's where we're going to begin. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Here it is. Whatever you keep from God ends up keeping you from God. Whatever you keep from God ends up keeping you from God. Now everybody help me out nice and loud. I want to hear you a couple rows away. Here we go. True or false, money is a big part of life. True or false? It's true, we all know that, right? You know, life is money, we get it, we understand. Like we, it's just, in fact, one sociologist did a study and he found that 80% of our time, Westerners, Westerners, you know, that's us in America, 80% of Westerners, or all Westerners, spend 80% of their time thinking about money, dealing with money, pursuing money, after money, 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 money. We spend our time working and earning money, we spend our time spending the money, we spend our time dreaming about money. It's like Westerners spend 80% of their time. They're waking hours engaged in things that have to do with money. No wonder Jesus Christ spoke of money so often. No wonder it was that common factor that he brought to almost every story. It had something to do with money in some way because money's not about a finance topic. Money's a life topic. All of our lives revolve around this. That's why it's such an important topic. And so as we begin today, there are a few facts from Jesus I just want to put on the table just to set our minds before we get going. Here's the first one. According to Jesus, money rivals God in our lives. 
Matthew 6, 24, he said, you can't serve both God and money. The number one competitor to God is money. In fact, we treat money the way we should treat God. We pursue money instead of pursuing God. We can love money instead of God. We can trust money instead of God. We can sacrifice for money instead of God. We, we even talk of the almighty dollar. Money rivals God, according to Jesus. Second thing, money reveals reality. According to Jesus, money reveals reality. Uh, Matthew 6, 21, he said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you think about the kind of heart you have, your money shows it. In fact, if you've ever been to a doctor, right? You go to a doctor and the doctor starts poking around. Every once in a while, the doctor will poke an unhealthy spot. And you're like, ow. Well, then obviously that would be the place to focus on. And I've discovered in my own journey, whenever I'm reading the words of Jesus or working through the Bible and then there's issues of money coming up, and I get to, ow. It's the Spirit saying, this is what we got to focus on. And I don't think I'm the only one. I think this is a common experience. Money rivals God, money reveals reality, and the third fact is that money creates responsibility. Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 12, and in this parable, verses 20 and 21, he called a guy a fool. He's a fool because the guy set his life up in such a way that he was rich toward himself and not toward God. He called him a fool. Some of you here today say, well, good news for me, I'm broke, and because I'm broke, I'm off the hook. Now listen, here's the newsflash. You have to understand, Jesus' audience had way less than anybody in this room. And so his words to them are his words to all who desire to follow him. And in this text today, we're going to learn about how to avoid the emptiness of a life that's just too full for God from a cautionary tale about a man who is known as a rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. Before we jump in, background is always a helpful thing, so let's set the background here. Mark chapters 8 through 10 is one unit that describes for us the nature of true disciples. So what does it really look like to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christ follower? Mark 8 through 10, that's what that section is doing. And right here in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, a young man runs up to Jesus runs up to him, falls down on his knees in front of Jesus, right at his feet. And this man is rich, according to our text. This man is young, according to Matthew 19, 20. And this man is a ruler, according to Luke 18, 18. Hence, in the Gospels, he's known as the rich, young ruler. And he runs up at Jesus, and he falls at his feet. And this rich, young guy has it all, except for one thing. And he asked Jesus a question about eternal life. Now, this story does not have a happy ending. Of all the people who ever fell at Jesus' feet, only this man, only this man went away worse than he came. This cautionary tale is a cautionary tale about how to be unchanged by Jesus Christ, how to be unchanged by God. For some of us here today, we're going we're to look at these scriptures, and we're going to be like, this explains a lot. If your God thing isn't moving, if things aren't changing, you're going to see some reasons why today. There's a newsflash. There are many Christians who try to explain away the words of Jesus in stories and scenes like we're going to see today, but the reality is Jesus is clear about the barriers that exist between us and God. So that's what we're going to look at today. So if you're taking notes, just a couple things real simply. You can write them down. Number one, barriers that keep you from God. And the first one, we'll call it relationship misconceptions. Relationship misconceptions keeps us from God. Now let me see your hand. If you've ever wondered in your mind questions about God. Can I see your hand? You ever have questions about God? It's our hope, our prayer, our desire that Colonial Church is that kind of place you can come and bring your questions about God and wander aloud and journey with others and just, just chase down some answers for the questions that we have. We, we, we all have had them. Maybe you've wondered, what is God really like? What does it mean to actually know God? And how can I actually know God? Maybe you've wondered these things. Swiss theologian from the late 19th, early 20th century, Karl Barth said that there are only two ways to come to a knowledge of God. The first one is you start with man and reason your way upward. That's what religion does. You know, and philosophy is another. You start with man, just kind of reason our way, hopefully up to God or something like that. The second way, he says you start with God and you receive his revelation to us. And that's what scripture does. 
But one day, rich young ruler comes running up to Jesus. And his words reveal to us that there's actually a third way. And that is to combine the first two ways. To have a religious way of approaching the scriptures to try to come to a knowledge of God. His ideas about knowing God expose some real misconceptions about God and knowing him. And these aren't just misconceptions for his day. These are misconceptions for our day. So if you're taking notes, we're going to look at these misconceptions. It involves two basic things. The first one, you can write this down. His first misconception was underrating God's goodness. Underrating God's goodness. Notice in Mark chapter 10, we're jumping in, verses 17 and 18. It says, and as he was setting out on his journey, this is Jesus, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Notice the word good occurs a few times there, right? Good teacher, and why do you call me good? And none is good, none are good but God. Note the uh, rich young ruler's enthusiasm. He comes running up to Jesus. He falls at his feet, and he asks him a question. Good teacher. He asks him all about eternal life. So what does Jesus do? Effectively, he splashes cold water right in his face. That's literally, effectively, what he does. He says to him, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So here's a question. Why does Jesus respond to him this way? Well, here's what's not happening. Jesus is not denying that he came from God, that he is God, that he's, he's not denying that. Here's what he's doing. He's actually deflecting this guy's flattery. It was not common in that day to go and call any teacher good. It is clearly understood by any monotheistic Jew that only God is good. And by coming to Jesus and referring to him as good teacher, something you never did for any rabbi, it was not appropriate at all. And so Jesus, in rejecting his flattery, is challenging him to stop and think about what you're saying. Stop and think about your concept of God. In other words, Jesus isn't impressed with what comes out of our mouths. Theologians refer to God himself as the summum bonum, the highest good. God is the highest good. He's the source of all goodness. He's the standard of all goodness. The plumb line of all that is good and perfect and true and right is the character of God, a good God. As wetness is to water, as brightness is to light, goodness is to God. This is his character. Question, what kind of person is God? Answer, he's perfect. He's good. And he is to be loved. He is to be trusted wholeheartedly. And so when this rich young ruler comes up and he asks Jesus a question about eternal life in verse 17, he asks him the right question, but he asks with the wrong assumption. Notice in verse 17, the question he asks him, he says, you know, he comes up and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice that little phrase, what must I do? What's going on here? This man assumes that goodness is something he could achieve. He assumes that ex acceptance with God is something that he can, in fact, earn, that there's something he can do to get in the right with God. It's a classic misconception. And there's really two sides of it. We looked at one. The first one is underrating God's goodness. But let's look at the second side of this very same issue. Let's talk about overrating your own goodness. He underrates God's goodness, and he overrates his own. Mark chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, Jesus continues on. Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. Notice his word commandments here. Jesus is like, you know the commandments. What's he talking about? Jesus is referring to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, he quotes six of them. He quotes commandment number five all the way through commandment ten. But here's the funny thing. He doesn't quote them in, in the right order. He quotes them a little bit backward, intentionally. First, he quotes five negative commands, don't. Then he quotes one positive command. Funny thing is they don't show up that way in the Ten Commandments. They show up the other way. 
So first, he says, you know, you know the command, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, don't smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run around with girls that do. I mean, that's what he's saying. Five negatives. Then he turns right around and throws out a positive. Oh, by the way, honor your mother and your parents. What's he doing here? Here's what Jesus is doing. He's meeting him where he is. He's a religious young guy. What do religious people know? They know more than anything. There's some things you just don't do. And the way to approach God is don't do stuff. You just don't. You just don't do things. God's happy when you don't do bad stuff. So Jesus starts there, and he throws in the positive one. Oh, and honor your father and your mother. Notice in verse 20, the response. He says, he says to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Really? Do you notice the word all there? All these things. Now, I get that you might have avoided the don'ts, but like honor your father. and Let's call the parents in here and get to the bottom of this. I'll guarantee you they have a different story than he does. And the rich young ruler claims that he obeyed all of these commandments since his youth. What's he saying? He's really referring to his own bar mitzvah. Every Jewish male at the age of 13 becomes responsible for the law. Bar mitzvah, son of the law. It's the 13-year-old. You are now responsible for your obedience for God. He's like, hey, ever since my bar mitzvah, I'm good, man. I got it. I'm good. Jesus' response reveals, first of all, some bad news. Then there's good news. And listen, it's always, you always have to get the order correct. First comes the bad news. Then comes the good news. Because without the bad news, the good news is no news. So we have to understand the bad news before we can understand the good news. Here's the bad news. Like this rich young ruler, many of us think that acceptance with God has to do with us doing some good stuff. We look at our lives like a scale. We got some good works and bad works. And if we do more good than bad, then God will one day add that up and go, mm, okay, and let you into heaven. That's how a lot of people look at it. That's how he was looking at it. Here's a problem. The scriptures, the commands of God, were not meant for you to go, well, I got some done, and we'll pile those here, and maybe they'll out. They're not meant for that. The law was not intended to give you points. The law was intended to show you what's wrong. A ruler is meant to show you how crooked stuff is. So two things quickly. The Bible itself refers to the law as a mirror. You don't look in a mirror to see how great you look. You look in a mirror to see how, what's wrong, don't you? You do. So here's the thing. A mirror can show you how dirty you are. Let me ask a question. Everyone answer yes or no out loud. A mirror can show you how dirty you are, but here's the question. Can a mirror wash you and make you clean, yes or no? No, it can't do it. It could show you how dirty you are, but a mirror can't wash you. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 says the law is good if you use it lawfully. Use it lawfully. And then he describes how to use it. It shows what's wrong in our life. So let's look at the x-ray. You go to the doctor, you get an x-ray. You got a broken bone. An x-ray can reveal what's broken. Everybody help me out nice and loud. Can an x-ray heal what's broken, yes or no? No, it can't. It can show you the break, but x-rays don't heal. The law doesn't wash your face for you. It can't make you clean. And the law doesn't heal the break in our own hearts and lives. It simply reveals these things. The problem with the good works view of acceptance with God is it's very superficial. It does not account for how good God really is. It doesn't account for how sinful we really are. And it doesn't account for what Jesus really did to fix those two problems. If God is perfect and we are not, we got a problem. Light and darkness don't just mingle. Something has to happen. Jesus Christ came to be that something that happened. So we've got some bad news. Here's the bad news. God's acceptance can never be earned. Bad news for those who are trying to on the treadmill to get there. There's no there. That's bad news. Now let's look at some good news. Here's the good news. Romans 8, 3 says, what the law could not do, God did in sending his own son. So here's the good news. Jesus Christ did for us what we could never do for ourselves. First of all, he lived the perfect life that you can never live. He didn't just not do all the don'ts in the law. He did all the do's. He fulfilled all the requirements for what a human being could be termed righteous before God. He did it all. He got it done. He obeyed God on our behalf. And on the other hand, he didn't just live the perfect life you could never live. He also offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for sin that you could never provide for your own. So he obeyed God on our behalf and he paid God 
on our behalf. Jesus Christ did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And all who belong to him are accepted in him by God forever. This is good news. This good news is called the gospel. The word gospel means good news. That's literally what it is. Dr. Tim Keller put it this way. I want you to see his quote. This is one that's worth writing down. Here it is. Dr. Tim Keller put it this way. He said, quote, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. This is the good news. Now listen, there are barriers that exist between us and God. The first one are these relationship misconceptions. But there's a second one. There's a second one. Second one we're going to call number two, discipleship misconceptions. Discipleship misconceptions. It is exactly at this point right here where many Christians wrongfully conclude, mistakenly conclude, well, if I belong to Jesus, then he has come into my life to make my life better. As if Jesus exists to be your life enhancer. Like he exists to come and add something to your life. He doesn't come to add to your life. He comes to destroy your life. So that you can have a brand new one in him, the one you were meant to have. I'll put it to you this way. Jesus will not squeeze himself down into your life. Rather, he will draw you up into his life. Yours is too small. He won't squeeze into it. Don't bother. That's why for many of us are going, well, that makes sense. He just won't do what I ask. No, he doesn't. He will not squeeze down into your life. But he will draw you up into his life, that's the one that you were meant to have. So get this, if you belong to Jesus, all he has belongs to you. His righteousness belongs to you. His acceptance with God belongs to you. His Holy Spirit belongs to you. If you belong to Jesus, all he has belongs to you, and if you belong to Jesus, all you have belongs to him. We call this discipleship. Discipleship, I'll just give you, this is my definition of discipleship. It is belonging to Jesus fully and becoming like Jesus fully. That's discipleship. That's what the Spirit of God comes into your life to do. To help you belong to him fully so that you can become like him fully. So let's get down to brass tacks. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, money talks? Can I see your hands? If, if money talks, what would it say? Mine always says, see ya. So mine says, for some of us, money says, sucker. I mean, if money talks, what would it say? Well, according to Jesus, our use of money does talk. And here's what it says. It tells the true story of my current state of discipleship to Jesus. That's what money says. Because at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would fasten your seatbelts. Statistically, on average, Christians in the United States give 2.5% of their income per capita to, to the church, to good charitable causes, and so forth. 2.5% Christians. You know, that's not too bad. Well, when you look at statistically, that's the average. 80% of Christians give 2%. So 80% of us give 2%. Um, here's the problem. During the Great Depression, the average Christian gave 3.3%. We've never had more. We've never given less. Money talks. What's it saying? It's talking about our discipleship. Here's another one. People who make less than $15,000 a year, I mean, you can look it up, folks. Look it up. Check me out. Check my references. People who make less than $15,000 a year, that's like poverty line, less than $15,000 a year, give 4 to 5% a year away. $15,000 or less, give 4 or 5% away. You go, that's pretty cool. People who make $100,000 or more per year give less than 1%. That's not cool at all. When he talks, what's it saying? Saying this is the current state of our discipleship. Americans give to Christian causes about the same amount yearly that they give for Christmas, that they do at their own Christmas, that they spend on their own Christmas. 
You tell me, what's the opportunity cost? Christmas, kingdom of God, lasts forever, Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm not saying don't do Christmas. I'm saying, what's the opportunity cost? What are we giving up? With this rich young ruler, Jesus raises three discipleship questions for him and for all who would follow after him. So if you're taking notes, you can write them down. Here they are, three quick questions. First question, number one, is this one. What is your real treasure? What's your real treasure? Mark chapter 10 and verse 21 says, and Jesus looked at him, loved him. Everyone say loved him, loved him. And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Notice this word treasure right here. He got this rich young guy. He's got it all, but he lacks one thing. And according to Jesus, that one thing is in the way between him and God. That one thing is in the way. That thing is his treasure. And Jesus loved him too much to not tell him the truth. So he told him the truth. What's the truth? Here it is. In order to come to Jesus and have a relationship with him, we have to forsake all other loves. How many of you are married? Can I see your hand? I've done a, a bunch of marriages. What if we're doing the vows? And I go, do you promise before God and these others to forsake all others? And then the guy says, no. How many of you are like, I'd be cool with that? All the ladies are like, I'm not cool with that. Coming to a relationship with Jesus means forsaking all other loves. Suddenly, this rich young ruler is faced with a choice between a relationship with Jesus or his own love for money. And the bottom line is to follow Christ, each of us has to overcome that same obstacle, each and every one. The turnstile into the kingdom turns one at a time, and we all have to confront that one, every one of us, self included. Let me ask you are you a Christ follower? Jesus says this to you He says, I have to be your true treasure, I have to be your goodness, I have to be your righteousness, I have to be your, your wealth or else we can't walk together. Now here's the, here's the deal. Jesus is not raising funds. He's raising family members. Jesus is not growing donations. He's growing disciples. He is not inviting us to a life of poverty. He's inviting us to a life of discipleship. And his primary goal isn't benevolence to the poor, as good as that is. His primary goal is our own undivided allegiance to him. First question what is your real treasure? Second question, who's the real owner? Who's the real owner? Notice verse 22 now. It says, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Notice these two words, disheartened and sorrowful. Both words in the original language in, in Greek, they describe the sky becoming overclass and storm clouds coming in. In other words, at Jesus' words, this rich young ruler's face fell, gloomy. Here's the irony in the text. He was sorrowful because he had great possessions. He was sorrowful because he had, by show of hands, how many of you would be happy if you came into church today, and by coming to church, you won great possessions? How many of you would be happy with that? I'd be happy with that. You know, you're not going to win great possessions here. I'm going to just guarantee you that right now. It's odd that, that he should be happy. He's got stuff. He's not happy. Why? Because Jesus just exposed the fact that he was owned by another God. Somebody once said that money is like flypaper. The fly goes, ooh, my flypaper. And then the flypaper says, ooh, my fly. Jesus loved him and loves you and loves me way too much for us to be owned by another God. Remember, this is the only man that ever fell at Jesus' feet and went away worse than he came. How do you become unchanged by Jesus? Blow this whole thing off. Turns out, this young man didn't have possessions. His possessions had him. And notice, the, notice the, the contrast. He comes running up. He runs up excited. He walks away sad. Newsflash. All who want to approach a relationship with Jesus on their own terms will go away disappointed. You don't go to the bank and set the terms. You don't come to God and set the terms. 
Turns out, he wants to be Lord of all. If he's going to be Lord at all. Three questions. What's your real treasure? Question number two. Who's the real owner? Here's the third question. Who's your real ruler? Who's your real ruler? Notice verse 23 now. It says, And Jesus looked around, and he said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Notice that phrase there, kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is life under the loving, wise, and liberating rule of God. The good news is that the kingdom of God is a whole new world opened in front of you in Jesus, a world of new life and new possibilities. It all comes through belonging wholeheartedly to Jesus as his disciples. That's good news. But here's the bad news. According to Jesus right here, if you have wealth, you have a handicap. You have a handicap. Notice he said how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter. Some of you are like, I'm safe. I don't have wealth. I'm good to go. Are you sure? If you have, well, let's do this. Raise your hand if you have a roof over your head that you live under. Keep it up, keep it up. Keep your hand up if you also have a decent set of clothes, not the ones you have, a decent set of clothes. Raise your hand, keep it up. If you have any kind of car for transportation, keep your hands up right there. You are among the world's wealthiest 15%. Right here, right here. I'll go ahead and put your hands down. Now we're going to do it again. Raise your hand and keep it up if you have a variety of sets of clothes at home. Go ahead and raise them up, keep them up. Re- keep your hand up if you have more than one car in your home available to you. More than one, more than one. And keep your hand up if you live in a home that you own. You are in the top five wealthiest percent in the world. We live in a world where one out of three people lives on less than $2 a day. That's 2.4 billion people live on less than two. That's none of you. That's not me. We are, by the world's standards, the poorest among us is incredibly wealthy. Here's the key. Jesus always requires those who come to him to put away their other gods. Gods of wealth or money, possessions, whatever. Because the point is, whatever we keep, whatever we keep for ourselves can actually keep us from entering the kingdom of God. It's that plain. You just read it and you go, yeah. George MacDonald was the intellectual mentor to C.S. Lewis. So most of Lewis's books and thoughts and ideas and Im- metaphors and images and ways of thinking came from reading George MacDonald. And George MacDonald had this to say. I want to put this up on the screen. George MacDonald said, It's not the rich man only who's under the dominion of things. They too are slaves who, having no money, are unhappy for the lack of it. The money one has and the money the other would have is in each the cause of an eternal stupidity. He's talking about the opportunity cost that money puts into our lives. It turns out, turns out, the opportunity cost for loving and keeping money to ourselves is far more than you ever bargained for. I just want to be completely honest with you. I grew up in an unchurched home. Uh, all my life, I couldn't stand Christians, Christianity. I thought it was total garbage. And the main reason, people on TV crying for money. I, I felt like the whole thing was a scam. But on September 26, 1990, I, was, I had a radical encounter with the risen Christ, and my life was transformed. We immediately began to share the gospel of Jesus in our own hometown. We, Rose and I, over the years, invited 23 different homeless people to come into our home and live with us. We paid for everything. So I had this big hang-up about money and church and religious weird stuff. And the moment I came to Christ, no problem at all with whatever I had making available for Jesus and his work and his church and his kingdom. Never had a problem. I have three sons. They're all grown adults. And they're all the three most generous people I know are those three boys. How? Because you don't become poor by opening your hand and your heart and allowing Jesus to have you and everything you have. You don't become poorer. You become richer. And so God will grow your heart. And I just want to 
I just wanted to put this in front of you. There, my own journey in our, the Botts family involved three stages, and we put it on the back of this card. When you came in, you got this card. Here's the Mark 10, 21 verse. If you have it, take it out real quick if you wouldn't mind. Flip it over, and you'll notice on the back, this, these are the three stages that I went through. And I'm pretty sure that the Spirit of God didn't invent them for me. I think they're probably true for everybody. First stage, you'll notice how to have treasure in heaven. First was just begin to give. Jesus said, your treasure and your heart, they're, the same. They, they're all bound together. They're inseparable. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. There's some of you, God has been good to you. He has used like colonial and all, to, to, bless, to speak into your life. You just never give. And so some of you, God is calling you to begin, to begin. So you know what, it's time to just start. If God has done good to you, get involved. Be a part of that. Pass it on. Give back so others can get what you've gotten as well. Be a part of it. For some of you, that's the call of God today is to begin. Second one is to give habitually. There's some of you, oh, we've done the first one. Kind of a little random, a little here and there. We've given, but give habitually. Notice there's a text on there, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. says, since you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, in complete earnestness, also excel in the grace of giving. Grow in this. God led us to a stage in our life we realized we were random. It was time to make it a habit, more of a habit. Some of you, God is calling you to make it a habit to open your hand and your heart to allow Jesus Christ to use your giving to bless others. Some, you've got to begin. Others, it's habitual, and there's a third group. And that is the third column, and that is begin to tithe. The word tithe in Hebrews, ma'aser, first tenth, goes to God. Whatever comes into your life, first tenth just goes right back to the local church so that God can continue to build the bride of Jesus to do and make her as healthy and awesome as he's called her to be. We have gone, and now the funny thing is in our own life, we've gone through all three of those stages really quickly. It's not like we go two years in the first one. No, it was, it was pretty quick. And all I'm saying is it's the Spirit of God inviting us into this very story we've looked at. There are some of you that things just are not happening in your journey. You're wondering what's going on, and the reality is God is inviting you to fully belong to him. And all Jesus has belongs to you, which means all you have belongs to him. Either that's happening and starting to happen and it's kind of growing, or it's not. And I wouldn't be doing my job and we wouldn't be loving you like Jesus loves you if we don't have these conversations to look at the truth and say, this is the truth, God help us to walk in it. Let's pray together. God, we recognize today that you, you've given us everything. You've given us life, you've given us breath. Every good thing we have comes from you. And we recognize today, God, that you, you are the real treasure. You're the real owner. And you are to be the real ruler. And so our prayer today, help us use money in a way that speaks faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Heads bowed and eyes closed. For some of you here today, you do consider yourself to be a follower of of Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. Christian, your money speaks. What's it saying today? Is it saying faithful follower of Jesus or is it saying not yet? If it's saying not yet, then the Spirit is saying to you it's time to get started. I believe the response for each of us today is one of those three boxes if you're a follower of Christ. Some of you have never ever begun to give at all in a local church. And today you can begin. Take the card, flip it over on the back, mark that first spot and say, I think God is calling you to that. And put your name and email at the bottom and turn it in because here's what we do. We want to pray for you. We're going to pray for you that you actually experience the goodness of God as you grow in these ways. And others of you, maybe it's the middle box. Some of you, it's time to give more habitually, not random, not once in a while, but make it a habit of giving back to Jesus so his church can be strong. If that's you, mark that one. Say, I think that's what God's calling us to do as a family. Put your name and email. Turn that in at the end of our time together so we can pray for you. And some of you, you've been doing those first two, and God is calling you up to the tithe, to, to be systematic and proportional, take the first tenth and just give it back to him and say, you have a percentage. It comes right back. We've been living there in the Botts family for a very, very long time, and we're well beyond the ma'as or the tenth, and we don't lack anything. And God wants to invite you into that very same special place a faithful following of Jesus there are others of you here today truth is you're in a different place you're in a place where you did, don't have a relationship with God you've been thinking that there's something you can do to earn God's approval and you've heard here today there's nothing you can you cannot be good enough 
for a perfect God to invite you into his presence. But here's the good news. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life you could never live, to die on a cross and offer perfect sacrifice for your sin that you could never provide. He obeyed for you. He paid for you. And if you were to, to, to hear his call right here and now, come, follow me. If you were to say, I'm going to forsake all other loves, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, you would belong to him and his spirit would come to live inside of you. You begin the process of making you into the person you were meant to be. And it all begins with a moment of surrender. And you can, you can have that moment here and now, right here with me. You could just simply pray, Dear Jesus, I, I am a sinner and I do need a savior. And I do believe that you are the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose from the grave to give new life. And right now I'm calling on you. I ask you to forgive all my sins, to come into my life, to fill me with your spirit and to make me new. And I ask you, Jesus, be my leader, be my savior, be my king, be my ruler, and I will follow you the best I can all my days by your grace. It is in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. For those calling on Jesus today, it is a special day, a day of celebration. So let's celebrate together for those who turn to Christ today. <laughs>